Okay, today we're going to talk about energy storage and demand management. So the quasi final exam questions for today um, are what types of energy storage exist? Uh, how could cost effective energy storage help expand the ability of wind and solar, so variable renewable energy, uh, to meet electricity demand? And how is demand response used in electricity systems? So we have referred to um, once or, or twice in the past in, in the previous lectures um, to cost-effective grid-scale um, energy storage technology as the, the holy grail. And a lot of that has to do with um, its potential to help uh, integrate uh, very large amounts of renewable energy into electric power systems and uh, dramatically decrease our reliance on traditional conventional sources of generation that might be carbon intensive like coal uh, and natural gas. But before we get to uh, talking about the use of um, energy storage technology alongside renewables, um, we should also acknowledge the, the benefits that are associated with energy storage um, in our current grid, which is not uh, dependent uh, as much on renewable energy. So, so why else would energy storage be useful to the grid? So there are a couple of different benefits. The first is um, that it could help improve grid reliability. Um, in many cases, um, you know, energy storage could provide a source of fast acting operational reserves, which we have talked about before. That's sort of unused um, generation capacity that's uh, left unused on purpose in order to respond to different sources of uh, contingencies like a, a forecast error in demand or um, in some cases a, a loss of uh, capacity, for example, a loss of transmission line or uh, a power plant that goes offline unexpectedly. Um, it could also help us flatten hourly generation requirements. So this would allow generators to run more efficiently at a stable power level. Um, so the whole idea here is that you would uh, store energy um, in energy storage devices whenever demand for electricity is low. Uh, and then you would discharge those energy storage devices whenever demand for electricity is high. Um, and, and the net effect of that would be to create energy, net energy demand patterns that are uh, less variable throughout the day and throughout the week. Um, and so the reason why this would be useful um, is because it would um, preclude, in some cases, our need for more expensive peaking uh, sources of electricity, for example, um, natural gas combustion turbines that are uh, not particularly efficient um, and might sell electricity at a higher price. Now, today we rely on those um, because our demand is fluctuating in this regular pattern and um, our sources of baseload generation, which would include nuclear and coal, are not flexible enough to ramp up during the middle part of the day to meet our peak demand. So we have to rely on more expensive sources like natural gas. But if we had flatter uh, demand requirements, um, potentially due to integration of energy storage technology, um, we might be able to meet a larger share of our overall demand using uh, baseload generation uh, instead of having to rely on more flexible peaking devices. Some other energy storage benefits have to do with um, decreasing transmission congestion and line losses uh, during peak demand periods, um, and in, in some cases actually being able to defer or avoid construction of new capacity for both generation and transmission. So I'll give you an example. This is an example from the Bonneville Power Administration um, footprint. So this is a sort of a, a federally owned utility that operates in the Pacific Northwest. So um, they own a lot of transmission uh, infrastructure as well as a lot of hydroelectric dams in the Pacific Northwest. Um, and in recent years, um, this is an area of the country that's um, experienced tremendous population growth um, in the Portland uh, metropolitan area. Um, and BPA found itself uh, needing to increase the amount of electricity that was able to reach the Portland area. Um, and so uh, what they were proposing to do is build a very large um, and expensive $722 million transmission project aimed at getting extra electricity down into the Portland area um, from uh, hydroelectric dams that were north of the city. Um, and so one of the things that they were able to do um, is actually cancel this very expensive transmission project, which was controversial for lots of reasons, for environmental reasons, 
um, but also due to the cost of the project. Um, and one of the ways they're able to cancel that project is by taking advantage of uh, energy storage technologies. And so the way that they could potentially do this is by um, storing electricity, by transmitting electricity from north to south using current or existing transmission lines during low demand periods, and then storing some of that extra electricity um, in energy storage devices. Uh, and then during high demand periods, when there's transmission congestion, and they're unable to get some of that electricity um, down from north to south, um, they can just rely on those batteries that are sort of co-located with uh, where demand exists. And then, of course, other benefits of energy storage are to help enable distributed generation. So this would be um, uh, generation, presumably mostly rooftop solar, that's uh, located at the point of consumption, um, and also to enable wind and solar to provide baseload power. So the way this works um, is that we would potentially store solar when solar is most prevalent. We would store some of that electricity and then discharge it uh, during the valleys. In other words, after the sun goes down. And um, the idea here is to turn solar, which is an inherently a variable resource tied to uh, the availability of solar insulation, um, into something that is more firm and stable uh, throughout the day uh, and throughout the week. So we talked about this last time. Um, it is not feasible to meet 100% of electricity demand with wind and solar without some type uh, of energy storage. But a different question we could ask is, do we need storage right now? Um, so let's take a look at what we have today in the grid. I mean, we're talking about wind and solar making up about 8% um, of the generation mix in the United States today. We still have a grid that's dominated by uh, the conventional generators, so natural gas, coal, uh, nuclear and hydro. Um, and last time we talked about some of the, uh, I guess, downsides of um, impact uh, of integrating renewable energy into to bulk electric power systems and wholesale electricity markets. It can provide challenges, uh, additional challenges for system operators in terms of long-term planning um, and short-term operations. A lot of that has to do with the intermittency of renewables. So you have to sort of plan um, for less, reliabil less reliability uh, from renewables. You don't always know how much you're gonna have um, out into the future. Um, and some of the variability also impacts conventional generators. It forces other types of power plants to ramp up and down in order to accommodate uh, the availability of wind and solar or lack thereof. Um, you know, it impacts other types of power plants um, uh, market share uh, and uh, renewable energy is part of why um, uh, electricity prices in wholesale markets can be low sometimes and that impacts other types of generators and also um, we've also we also talked at the end of um, the lecture last time about how integrating more renewable energy sometimes hurts mostly other renewable energy providers uh, because of low prices and curtailment um, but I would say that a lot of these issues um, don't require storage um, to overcome um, and aren't that big of a deal uh, in terms of increasing cost or uh, causing um, you know, major um, negative impacts uh, for electricity markets and for customers. Um, what if we only wanted to get to 50% uh, wind and solar instead of 100%? Um, the answer really is no, we don't absolutely need uh, energy storage to achieve much more uh, penetration, much higher penetration of, of renewable energy in, in, in the United States than we currently have. Um, and the reason is that there are other strategies and technologies we could use to help integrate um, uh, renewable energy onto the grid. Um, so one option, and this is one we're going to talk about later today, is demand side management. So you could shift electricity consumption um, of customers um, to, to better reflect the natural sort of patterns of when wind and solar are available. Um, and that could be through real-time pricing or through demand response. Um, and so we could use uh, uh, smart or flexible demand um, in coordination with uh, battery storage or other flexible renewables um, like, uh, like hydropower in order to balance supply and demand uh, in grids that are relying more on uh, variable wind and solar. Other options that we discussed last time uh, included making sure that uh, wind and solar capacity is spatially distributed and connected. 
Um, and so what that would allow us to do is um, to smooth out some of the variability in wind and solar. For example, if you had one part of the grid that temporarily had an overabundance of wind of solar, while another part of the grid uh, didn't have as much, and those two grids were connected by a transmission, um, then you could uh, sort of balance out the supply and demand. You could send electricity from the place that has too much wind and solar to the, to the place in the grid that doesn't quite have enough. Uh, so one of the main downsides of increased reliance on transmission, and we talked about this last time, is that it's extremely expensive. Um, and it's, um, it's difficult to understand who's going to pay for it. Um, and there are environmental downsides and um, property rights downsides in terms of building uh, new transmission projects to get uh, renewable energy from where it's produced to where it needs to be consumed. Um, we also uh, sort of alluded to uh, in a previous lecture the, the potential for natural gas combined cycle power plants to play a role in helping to integrate uh, variable renewable energy. So remember, these are um, a, a special type of natural gas power plant that are highly efficient because they take advantage of um, some of the, the exhaust heat um, that's produced uh, in, a, in a combustion turbine, um, and they pass that uh, through a heat exchanger that heats up water into steam um, that itself runs a, a separate power generation um, cycle based on steam. And so you have um, power plants that are about 60% efficient in terms of capturing a lot of that embedded chemical energy in the natural gas and converting it to uh, electricity. Uh, and these power plants are also tend to be highly flexible. So the advantages here is that they have uh, pretty low emissions of CO2 compared to a coal plant, uh, no thermal pollution because they um, have a, a newer um, closed loop cooling systems, uh, no emission of mercury and other air toxics because those are less prevalent in natural gas. Same thing with um, sulfur dioxide and nitrous oxides um, and no solid waste removal. So we're not producing some sort of coal ash um, that needs to be stored uh, and potentially could be detrimental to the environment. Um, and so we referred to, to natural gas combined cycle plants in a previous lecture as a blue bridge to a, a green future. Um, these are much more flexible. They have lower start costs and higher ramp rates than coal plants. So they're better positioned uh, to turn on and off and ramp up and down in order to help integrate wind and solar. Uh, and so I guess the good news is that recently new capacity um, that's been installed in the United States has been a mix of natural gas combined cycle and renewables. So, um, you know, grid operators and system planners are um, apparently taking advantage of the potential um, complementary nature of variable renewable energy like wind and solar um, and newer combined cycle natural gas power plants. But let's get back to energy storage devices now. Um, so there are different characteristics that we use to describe uh, potential energy storage technologies. One is energy density, which means how much uh, energy or electricity can actually be stored uh, by a device. Uh, the second is power density. This is how much energy or electricity can be discharged per unit time. Efficiency refers to how much input energy is eventually discharged. Um, so most energy storage devices um, when you put energy in, you don't get all of that energy back out. So they're actually net consumers of electricity, similar to how we talked about pumped uh, storage hydro, uh, hydropower in a previous lecture. Um, and then the other characteristics that's, that's always important to consider is cost. So uh, given those four characteristics, what would we say an ideal storage device would be? Uh, well, it would be one that has a high energy density, so we can store of a, lot, a lot of electricity in the device, a high power density, which means uh, the energy that is stored in the device can be discharged uh, very quickly to respond to, for example, a, a need for electricity suddenly on the grid, uh, whether that's caused by a, a forecast error in demand or a contingency where uh, a power plant goes down or um, a loss, sudden loss of, of wind or solar. Uh, we want something that's high efficiency, which means that we get almost all of the energy that we put into the device back out, uh, and we want it to be low cost. Um, and the issue here is that uh, a, a battery energy storage devices that hit all four of these characteristics um, don't quite exist yet, but we're working on it. So in general, what we see is sort of a trade-off between energy density and power density. 
Um, so the, the types of energy storage devices that you can store a lot of electricity in um, are generally um, a little bit slower to, to discharge that electricity back onto the grid. So there are three types of grid scale storage of electricity. Um, there's mechanical energy storage, chemical storage, which would be batteries, and thermal storage. So let's talk about mechanical energy storage first. One of these we've already talked about, pumped storage hydropower. So this is actually uh, makes up 99% of the existing energy storage market in the United States. Uh, so remember, pump storage hydropower um, takes advantage of the proximity of two different reservoirs that are separated um, by lateral distance, but also by vertical difference. And so the idea here is that you have some sort of upper reservoir that is able to release water and produce electricity um, by discharging water downstream. Uh, and then that water is collected by a lower reservoir. Uh, and so water in the lower reservoir can actually be pumped back up using electricity um, up back up to the upper reservoir. And the idea here is that you would be producing electricity, releasing water from the upper reservoir um, during high demand or high value periods of the day. And then you would be pumping water from the lower reservoir back up to the upper reservoir. So you're using electricity during the low demand or low price uh, periods of the day. So one of the main issues with pump storage hydropower is that it's geographically limited in the exact same respect that um, hydropower in general is limited. A chemical storage refers to batteries. Um, and so there's a couple different uh, potential chemical storage devices and they all have um, different advantages and disadvantages. Um, the market leader at the moment is lithium ion battery technologies. Um, this is what we use in our laptops uh, and in electric cars. So this figure shows uh, the current dominance of lithium ion battery storage in terms of installed power um, globally. Um, it was not always so in the early 2000s, the market was um, sort of carved up between lithium ion, um, lead acid, sodium sulfur and flow batteries. The third uh, type of energy storage that we'll talk about is thermal storage. And so one example um, that we've talked about before uh, is actually molten salt in concentrated solar power insulation. So we, we talked about two different types of solar power, uh, photovoltaic uh, and concentrated solar power. And one of the advantages that we talked about uh, with concentrated solar power uh, is the fact that you could store the, the thermal energy that's embedded in the, um, the working fluid uh, that's heated up in those parabolic troughs um, and uh, usually that's molten salt, so it's some sort of fluid that can get really, really hot but not boil. Um, and you're, you can store the, the thermal energy in the molten salt in storage tanks, uh, and the molten salt retains a significant amount of the heat for a long period of time. Uh, and that means you can generate energy um, using uh, these parabolic troughs, uh, store that energy in the form of hot molten salt liquid, uh, and then when you want to actually produce electricity, you transfer that uh, molten salt to a heat exchanger where it's interacting with a steam cycle. So it's heating water up to generate electricity, to generate steam, which is then passed through a steam turbine in order to generate electricity.